Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and today's guest is Jesse Carbonda. He's the outgoing executive director of Hoosier Environmental Council. How are you doing, Jesse? Welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Sean. Oh, good. I'm glad to, you know, meet up with you. Uh, it sounds like uh, there's been a little bit of a buzz. You, uh, you know, getting ready to, to depart the HEC. So, you know, it was a good time to maybe catch you and and see what's going on and, and you know, learn a little bit more about HEC and what your plans are in the future. So tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, HEC, the Hoosier Environmental Council and what they do for the listeners, because this broadcast and this podcast is going to a lot of different locations throughout the world, actually. And uh, some people may not know who the Hoosier Environmental Council are. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be on, Sean. And, and the Hoosier Environmental Council is Indiana's largest environmental advocacy organization. And we've been around for 38 years. And if you were to summarize what we do, we work to uh, advance environmental health and justice, protect land and water, and foster climate solutions. And the way that we try to do that is through multiple tools, education, outreach, technical assistance, and most of all through advocacy, which could be in the state house, it could be in the courts, it could be before the regulatory agencies. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of HEC um, back in the day when I was a former regulator for the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. I think, you know, I always kind of tracked on what HEC is doing and the newsletters game to all the, the staff there. It was really kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, how did you get started in this field, you know, and became the director 14 years ago? Well, I, um, it's, it's been an interesting journey. I mean, when I was in high school and college, I um, assumed it would be a career focused on domestic issues. Then um, I got moved by uh, a lot of the, the poverty and environmental degradation in the developing world. And that uh, trajectory lasted through uh, the latter part of college and graduate school. And uh, I reached a point where I began to realize that you know, America really wasn't stepping up in terms of being an international climate leader, even though it's something that's not only compelling from an environmental perspective, but from an economic one. And so I wanted to be involved in the effort in America mm -hmm. to, to try to address climate change. And the focus of my career ended up being shifting again from an international focus, particularly on South Asia, to a focus on the Midwest, where I have, was born and raised, uh, because I see the Midwest as, as being the center of the action. Um, you know, when you think about uh, the U.S. In, in historical perspective, we've been the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the world historically. Mm. The Midwest has been the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., and Indiana, mm. it turns out, is actually the largest carbon emitter on a per capita basis in the industrial Midwest. So that's kind of the big picture of why I focused my career on the Midwest and how I got involved in Indiana actually happened by accident, you could say, or maybe by divine hand. Uh -huh. um, and if it's the latter, or even if it's the former, it, it happened on a wintry day back in either 2005 or 2006. I still am need, needing to pull out the archives there as to the precise date. But um, uh, one of my colleagues at the place I was working at, the Environmental Law and Policy Center, couldn't make a briefing to uh, rural county commissioners in uh, Western Indiana. And so I joined another colleague of mine and we went there and I thought it would be a one-off event. But I was so intrigued about the possibility of making change in a conservative cultural context It's Indiana. And I was felt that there was something about my leadership skills that would actually be a good fit in trying to build broad coalitions to foster environmental change in the context of Indiana. Wow. Okay. So you, st it's so, you know, from helping, you know, a case out in Midwestern, you know, Indiana, you know, kind of, you know, obviously an opportunity arose for you to be uh, called upon to say, Hey, can you help lead the HEC? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh what happened was that I was so intrigued by this one possible, this one opportunity in Benton County to talk about wind power uh, to a couple of county commissioners that we struck a friendship and it eventually led to the formation of a coalition called ICRE, the Indiana Coalition for Renewable Energy and Economic Development, not the, <laughs> not the <laughs> easiest title to share. And eventually, uh, Sean, that got the attention of U.S. Senator uh, Richard Luger. 
And he was really intrigued by this big tent model uh, that uh, I was helping to, to foster as kind of the de facto head of this coalition. And eventually we began to do forums and workshops in different parts of Indiana, partly um, thanks to Senator Luger's staff introducing us to different uh, leaders in the state. And that got the attention of the Hoosier Environmental Council board. And they were intrigued by the type of leadership vision that I had, which again was about trying to draw in whole new constituencies into the environmental movement. And I think uh, that was a clincher in terms of uh, their recruiting. Yeah, that's people. that's great. I mean, especially, you know, from a conservative state and, you know, a conservative, uh, you know, legislative leader like, you know, Luger, that's great. I mean, so, you know, what now are some of the big issues that HEC is focusing on that you've been working on over the past few years that are really near and dear to your heart uh, and to the, to the you know, HEC community? Well, you know, the one way I could summarize the many initiatives that we work on is to, to kind of revisit those pillars that we think about when we talk about HEC, environmental health and justice, land and water protection, and climate solutions. So under mm -hmm. environmental health, we have a special focus on coal ash and factory farming. These are two issues that are united in the sense that these uh, represent big ecological risks to Indiana. If there is a breakage in, in a factory farm manure pit, or if there's a breakage in a coal ash waste pit, you're running. It could be catastrophic. It could be catastrophic. Exactly. And we <laughs> saw it happen in 2008 in, in Tennessee, you know, yep. in that little town, just two and a half uh, hours south of Indianapolis in which 1 billion gallons of coal ash ended up in one single river. And on the factory farm side, of course, the risk isn't quite the magnitude of coal ash, but still, uh, you know, if you have a, an episode where you're spreading factory farm manure onto a farm field and there's a big rain event or there's a, uh, yes. there's a big flood, all of a sudden, tens of thousands of fish are dead um, because of the nitrogen and, and uh, phosphorus uh, runoff. Uh, and E. coli. E. coli, exactly. All those yeah. things. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> very familiar with all, you know, confined feeding operation and, and, you know, having a lot of uh, E. coli hit the, hit the rivers and the, uh, the streams in the state, especially from combined sewer overflows there, they could be a big problem. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, the thing is we made such great strides in water quality over the last several decades, you know, in, in terms of regulating the pollution that comes out of wastewater treatment plants or uh, that comes out of factories, but we haven't made nearly as much progress in the realm of factory farming. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Sean, to, to sort of wrap up answering this big picture question you've asked, I'll, I'll mention a couple other things that are really important to ATC and our members. Sure. Uh, in the realm of protecting land and water, we have special focus on wetlands because mm -hmm. today only about 3% of Indiana is covered by wetlands. At one point, it was almost a quarter of the entire uh, acreage of our state. Uh, we're also very interested in, and focused on forest protection and the fact that, once again, 90% of Indiana, some of which was forested wetland, but 90% of Indiana uh, pre-European settlement was forested, and now it's about 20%. And then under the realm of climate solutions, how do we foster more renewable energy, more mass transit, more passenger rail, particularly in the state where you've got these old school industries having a lot of political clout in the legislature? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. I mean, those are some really key uh, pillars there to, uh, to actually work on. I mean, because there's a lot there on each one of those pillars to address. And so, well, how difficult is it to get legislation passed versus blocking legislation when you're, you know, trying to fight for, a, you know, a cause, you know, uh, an issue? Yeah, I mean, it. one would wish, you know, when I when I became ED, when I had my first legislative session under my leadership in 2008, Sean, we must have introduced we must have drafted at least four or five, maybe even half a dozen bills. Uh -huh. We had a big, ambitious legislative agenda. And, you know, you get humbled uh, year session after session where, where you end up resulting in having to narrow uh, your proactive legislative agenda and expand your bandwidth to fight off uh, terrible legislation. Mm -hmm. And what's unfortunately happened over these 14 years is even though there are more constituencies that care about the environment, in 2021 than there were in 2007, my first year as director, uh, you know, the legislature has become in some ways more hostile 
to environmental protection over that period of time. Mm. Yeah, I could I could see some of that, but I think don't you feel like there is a bit of a shift in uh, some of the lawmakers, uh, you know, view on on environmental concerns, especially around climate. Uh, you know, I, it's really it's really hard to argue. If you're, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on that you can't, that, you know, climate change isn't really happening. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, no, it's not. I mean, it's obvious it is. And so are you seeing a, a shift there? It's, it's really hard to measure, Sean. You know, I, I can say that um, um, there are certain constituencies, for example, on the conservative side where you've seen movement, uh, you see it among young evangelicals, for example, uh, you see it among, and, and that's getting expressed in young pastors, young evangelical pastors speaking up, writing editorials, talking to their lawmakers very directly about climate change. Uh, you see it in, in someone like U.S. Uh, Senator Mike Braun, who is extremely uh, conservative, actually much more conservative than he was as a state lawmaker, who has still found a niche for himself in the climate uh, action movement by trying to get farmers engaged in carbon sequestration. But I think that in general, it's hard. It's hard to measure because it's a term that still is very loaded among a, a large percentage of conservatives. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. I can say that gives me hope that we will be able to engage a broader uh, breadth of people is the fact that we as a state have had some pretty significant natural disaster issues that have been historically unprecedented. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are historically very significant, I should say. For example, uh, that we had a, a drought in Indiana almost 10 years ago. That was the first time that all 92 counties uh, were natural disasters area, natu natural disaster areas for drought. And uh, Elkhart County just a couple of years ago had the worst flooding in almost a half a century. So the thinking is that when you've got natural disasters of that magnitude, um, you know, policymakers are going to pay attention that, um, you know, we've got to do something about extreme weather. They may not be wedded to the notion of climate change, but they'll realize we've got to create more resilient infrastructure in the face of extreme weather. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there are, you know, I had a question about basically, you know, why are most environmental policies sponsored by liberal lawmakers versus conservative lawmakers? That was one part of my question. And then kind of a follow up to that was, you know, are you know, are you seeing any trends that, you know, both sides of the aisle, you know, over the past 14 years? What what's changing in your view? Um, is, is there a little bit more coming to the middle, so to speak, I guess, is, is kind of, you know, the, the big question. Yeah, those are those are both great questions. Uh, with respect to the first one, I think the big distinction between progressive and and conservative lawmakers is obviously over worldview. And uh, you know, progressives I think have the attitude of okay, well, the private sector is doing good work to try to protect the environment. Maybe it's you know, IU being a, a leader in the Big Ten on for lead certified buildings, or uh, Elkhart County uh, beginning to get into the realm of manufacturing RVs that are uh, electrified. Those are really good, notable areas of environmental progress in our state. But I think a progressive will say, but it's not sufficient to really meet the challenge, right? So can you significantly decarbonize the power sector unless you have the right public policy in place? And that's the sort of mindset or thinking of the progressive. I think the thinking of the conservative is, well, I got elected because my I want to actually um, weaken government authority or deregulate uh, industries because that's consistent with my worldview. Uh, so I think that's a, the major distinction as to why you see progressives more uh, more likely to introduce uh, pro environmental legislation mm -hmm. than conservatives. But I will say, and this really speaks to your second question about trends, that you do see conservatives willing to stick their necks out, neck out for solar energy policy, where they will. Yeah bipartisan uh, legislation. Uh, you see this also with respect to the wetlands bill that was extremely controversial. In fact, probably the most controversial bill of any bill uh, in the 2021 session in which you had some Republicans really speak out very forcefully against this bill. And, and so that's a positive thing that you see that there's a strand of conservative lawmakers who are willing to advance good progressive 
uh, or I should say good environmental policy without the label of progressive or conservative, good policy yeah. that ultimately leads to a better environmental quality. But I would say that there's another block of Republicans, uh, in my view, Sean, that have become a lot more conservative than their forefathers and foremothers. And that's translating into situations where they're actually trying to repeal <clears throat> public policies that their Republican brethren 20 or 30 years ago were enacting. We've seen mm. that with respect to wetlands. We've seen that with respect to solar energy efficiency. Uh, we've seen this with respect to recycling. In all those four categories, it was Republicans that enacted far-sighted legislation, and it's more conservative than Republicans that are working to weaken, if not repeal them. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's not good. I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, the kind of Republican I'm, I'm more supportive of is like, you know, the, the, the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, conservation type uh, Republican who, you know, they, we want to take care of the land and we want to, you know, we want uh, better uh, energy, uh, you know, renewable energy out there. I mean, we want to recycle our, our waste and, and, you know, reduce our consumption of natural resources. I mean, that's just common sense. It's all going to eventually go away if we keep, you know, plowing through it, you know, endlessly, endlessly. So, I think I think it just needs to be more education needs to ha happen. And, and I think, you know, it makes business sense. That's the other thing. It's not rocket science here. Right. I mean, come on. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> so I mean, all right. So, uh, you know, talk, talk a little bit about the strategies HEC deploys to generate grassroots campaigns and support, you know, an issue or, or you know, to be against an issue. I mean, you know, what really goes on behind the scenes? Like you guys are going to, you know, it, you know, you know, kind of go out and really, you know, develop a campaign to get out there. Well, how do you deploy that? It's changed over time. I mean, uh, pre my tenure as director, um, you know, and it, it was a lot of door knocking. And of yep. course, now we're in the middle of this year two of the pandemic. And of course, that's out of the picture. So we've got to be creative in how we go about organizing. And I think that one critical aspect of it is social media, sure. uh, which is, you know, we've got, I don't know, around 17,000 people who follow us on social media right now. So that's a pretty nice constituency to marshal yeah. uh, in the event of some bad bill or some positive bill. Uh, another dimension of it is very targeted organizing, which is to say that um, one thing that we've really observed about how the way that the legislature operates is that power is extremely concentrated. Yes, there are 150 lawmakers, but they absolutely do not have equal say in public policy. Public policy ends up uh, being really the product of probably about a half dozen lawmakers. And that means that we need to make sure that there's a proper pro-environmental constituency. Again, it doesn't necessarily need to be liberal or conservative. It could be the full breadth of the political spectrum that are actively seeking out uh, time with their lawmakers and trying to influence them, influence their thinking. Um, so, so you guys are, you know, kind of actively engaging these, these, you know, key lawmakers and developing relationships with them to communicate, you know, your position on these issues. I mean, what's that look like when you guys go do this? I mean, imagine, you know, you've got to be having one-on-ones with these guys or gals. Absolutely. <laughs> Both, uh, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, the the virtue of the pandemic is it's really led to this proliferation of um, Zoom. Uh, and so we've had, you know, last session we had several Zoom meetings with lawmakers, and it was actually mutually beneficial. And it's something that I would really encourage your listeners, whether they're listening from Indiana or anywhere in the country or world, that uh, you know, take advantage of this tool to have a conversation with your elected official. I mean, it 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 really simplifies the ability to meet them. Yeah. I got to imagine it's less adversarial too, right? It kind of breaks down that, that tension barrier because you know what, you're not in the same room. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'll meet with you, you know, sure. Let me get on this call for if, you know, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, and you know, to, to add on to that, I mean, I suppose that, you know, <clears throat> if a lawmaker is heading to Denny's or Cracker Barrel or, or wherever they go to, Meet a, meet a constituent, you know, maybe they got stressed out because they've been in traffic for a half an hour. Well, on the other hand, they're in their pajamas at, at home, <clears throat> yeah. just wearing a tie and maybe that. Yeah. Relax. Shorts and split flops and they can do it. I mean, it's like, let's jump on and get it done. And then I'll, you know, I'll take, I'll take, uh, take your points into consideration. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, that's good. Well, I mean, so so really, when you're really sizing up some issues, I mean, you're really trying to figure out how do we, you know, divide and conquer, you know, these types of, you know, issues with the, the people you have to coordinate with. I mean, you guys are really trying to figure out, you know, well, who who's got, you know, coverage in the areas with that you're, you know, needing to, you know, communicate with what legislature do I need? A, and, and I got to imagine that's pretty tough because it's always changing. So mm-hmm. every two years or so talk about that. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's another layer of complexity, absolutely to advocacy, which is that um, the combination of, um, you know, it's a part-time legislature in Indiana. And what that means is that uh, there's a real risk of turnover because people, you know, have to make a living. And sometimes it's hard. It's a hard juggling act to be running a business and trying to be a truly faithful and, and devoted lawmaker. Uh, so that leads to turnover. And then, of course, our uh, legislative districts in both the Senate and the House were uh, re, re, were changed through the redistricting process. And that's led to uh, kind of another uh, round of, uh, of, of turnover that's going to happen. More than a dozen lawmakers have declared their intention of leaving the legislature because of the redistricting effort. So, um, yeah, it absolutely makes it more difficult. It requires you to recalibrate really every session. Who are the people that you really need to influence in that particular session? Although there are some constants, you know, particularly if the districts are written in are, are written in such a way, the maps are written in such a way that uh, you know they lead to incumbency uh, being favored, which oftentimes happens. The self interest self-interested approach to map making um, leads to a situation where you've got chairpersons who've been in power for 10 or 15 years. And so you know exactly who you need to influence. During uh-huh. that. Well, so when you guys are really trying to, I guess, you know, fight an issue, you know, how effective is suing an agency like IDEM or EPA over, you know, a topic or over a, a, an issue you guys are passionate about, you know, what major outcomes have come from these types of efforts that you've been involved with, if any? Uh, I, the answer is it depends. And uh, <laughs> you know, if we zoom out here, as we talked about, you know, there are several different strategies that ATC pursues to try to effectuate change. Sometimes it's education, sometimes it's outreach, sometimes it's technical assistance, sometimes it's legislative advocacy, and sometimes it's through the courts. And usually the, the thinking is, well, let's see if we can reason with a polluter and you know, get them to change their behavior. And if they're intransigent, then we will sue them. And and so I think the easiest way to summarize it is, I think we have a higher record of effectiveness when we are suing the polluter itself. When we are suing the government to get them to do a better job in being a watcher. Governing. Of <laughs> exactly. That's hard. Um, but I do think that it, I think if I were to boil it down, it leads to the government being more on its toes. So for example, we sued the federal government several times over the new terrain I-69 highway project in Southwest Indiana. Mm -hmm. And we did so because we were very concerned about the loss of thousands of acres of woodlands and wetlands and and, uh, prime farmland. And, uh, you know, we were not successful in that legal strategy, but what I think it did do is it made the federal government more conscientious in how they were implementing the federal laws that govern highway construction such that there was less environmental damage over time because of the accountability we provided through the courts. And maybe they reevaluated their process and their approach to the the, the uh, design of these uh, new highways and byways and took more into account, you know, I guess environmental impacts as associated with maybe creating a bigger buffer strip or reforced it, you know, re, you know, planting new trees in and around these areas to kind of replace some of the damage that they cause. Right. I mean, is that, is that any of the outcomes that you've seen? Uh, you know, I don't know if I would, uh, be go that, that far. It's, it's a humbling endeavor. It's a humbling endeavor, but we have to do it. Right. I mean, um, you know, uh, it, it depends. For example, we had a very successful lawsuit uh, against the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, that was decided just a few weeks ago. And right. the outcome of that was really uh, very uh, significant in which the Corps has to go back to the drawing board and assess 
the damage that this factory farm up in um, northwest central Indiana has done to the surrounding area. And let me mm. just take a step back and just provide a very brief uh, context picture. on this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Indiana used to have a wetlands area uh, that rivaled the Everglades in Florida. It was called the Everglades of the North. And it was um, uh, in the Kankakee River. It was centered in the Kankakee River watershed area. And of course, that got decimated in a very short period of time due to very aggressive industrial and agricultural development. Now, thankfully, uh, thanks to foresighted conservationists and environmentalists, some of that has been restored. Ironically, uh, there was a proposal to build a massive dairy farm literally adjacent to one of those restored areas. And not only is it adjacent to this restored prairie area, um, but it is very near a high school, very near junior high, and very near several other nature areas uh, in Newton County. Uh, and so, of course, because of the significant ecological and public health threat posed by this factory farm, we sued uh, in, on different fronts, local, state, and federal. And at the federal level, we won this lawsuit. So this is a very concrete example of the fruit of mm. the federal government for the betterment of our ecosystems. Well, that's good. So, so that's your legal approach to advocacy and 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 you know fighting for what you feel is you know good environmental uh, policy. Um, you know, talk about how you guys are defending environmental justice and and what strategies are you what strategies are you pursuing to address that? Because there's a lot of EJ issues throughout the state. Absolutely. And, you know, we think of EJ both in the context of rural Indiana and rural uh, and urban Indiana. I think mm -hmm. oftentimes in the consciousness, it's urban Indiana. And for good reason. You think about the tragedy that happened up in Flint, Michigan, or the yep. cancer uh, corridors along the Mississippi in uh, Louisiana, where you've just got a cluster of, you know, uh, heavily polluting facilities that are in poor communities, oftentimes communities of color. Um, the nature of environmental justice in, in Indiana, I think, is different. Of course, in Lake County, it's similar to what we see, say, in uh, Louisiana, in that there's a high cluster of industrial uh, facilities. But one of the differences, for example, in the Indianapolis context is, is that the nature of the disproportionate burden of pollution, which is kind of the heart of what environmental justice is, that certain communities bear a disproportionate burden of environmental pollution. The form of it in Indiana and, and in places like Indianapolis is different. In, in Indy, I think it's fair to say one of the key issues is um, excess exposure to particulate matter compared to wealthier and whiter communities, or it is lead. Um, that they are exposed to higher levels of lead-based pipes or lead-based paint uh, because they- Older communities and have used that material for years and years and is hanging around and, you know, around the soil and around the home properties. Yeah, I mean, especially in the older neighborhoods. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the other messages, you know, to share is that, again, environmental injustice is also a reality in rural Indiana and rural America where you've got situations where- Maybe it's a, a poor um, landowner uh, who um, has a private well and um, they don't have the money to maybe necessarily test for every kind of contaminant. And it turns out that their well is, is contaminated by factory farm manure or uh, pesticides or fertilizers from you know, runoff or from uh, a landfill uh, system, leachate system that has, uh, has kind of... Uh, desiccated over time or, um, uh, you know, coal ash, a waste pit where the coal ash has leached into the groundwater and finds its way into the aquifer uh, in which the uh, private well owner is drawing their water. So we have to- Or, or, or people living around a big old landfill that's been out there in the middle of nowhere that, you know, getting uh, exposed by groundwater contamination. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. That's right. Or a failing septic tank. So there's a whole array of, of risks that, that rural uh, folks face as well. And uh, I think because of that, um, we hope that it creates a kind of a, a unique political coalition for environmental justice in Indiana that brings together African-American lawmakers that represent a lot of these urban communities and rural white uh, lawmakers who, again, represent these rural 
districts. No, that's good. I mean, you know, I think everyone should have, you know, clean water, clean air, you know, safe place to live and, and not have to worry about, you know, having bad drinking water and, and things like that. Right. I mean, um, you know, this whole EJ thing, I just, I just, you know, I've been doing a lot, a couple uh, podcasts here in the past, uh, you know, several months now. And, and one of the bigger episodes I recently did was, uh, with Robert Balot, uh, who is the, uh, uh, the attorney that, uh, you know, settled a lot of those cases with DuPont on the, um, dark, you know, for the dark waters movie and all the PFAS and all of that is EJ. I mean, all that is community, all those people in the community affected by contamination that they had nothing to do with. And, mm-hmm. and that's such a, it's such a shame. Um, it speaks to a lot of what you're just talking about environmental justice. So, well, how is HEC helping drive solutions to build strong economy hmm. and protect the environment? Because that's kind of maybe, maybe, uh, most people might think that's a dichotomy in thoughts, you know, it's like, wait a minute, how does that work? But I think strong economy and protecting the environment can go hand in hand. Absolutely. And, you know, in some ways that's been the hallmark of my, my tenure, which is to emphasize that theme that these two things can thrive at once. And the way that I think we've answered that is in two distinct ways. One is to help to foster those types of economic sectors that are inherently have less of an environmental footprint than their predecessors did. So we have been consistent leaders on solar energy, on mass transit, on passenger rail, sectors that intrinsically have a lower environmental footprint than their predecessors do and yet create Uh, considerable numbers of jobs. You know, in fact, one of the things that I'm really fond about talking with respect to solar jobs is that some of the solar jobs, some of the solar companies that are most successful in Indiana are located in economically less invested areas. There's one up in Carroll County uh, whose per capita income is lower than the average per capita income in the state. There's a company that is in on the east side of Indianapolis in a, again, a less invested area or a divested area, you could say, thriving there. So I think the beauty of these new sectors, solar, mass transit, rail, is that they can be located in communities in Indiana and in neighborhoods of Indiana that are underinvested, uh, which I know is a great source of economic pain in our state. The, The other dimension of kind of advancing both the economy and the environment simultaneously is in sectors like recreation, which is that the case for improved water quality is not only about making sure that everyone has access to clean water, but it's also to make our recreational sector even stronger. You know, one of the things that's blown me away, Sean, is that in Indiana, we employ about 140,000 people in the realm of recreation. And boy, you know, the more we can clean up our, our lakes and rivers, the more that sector can thrive. Oh, absolutely. No, that's, that's good. I mean, right. And I think most, you know, that's, that's the place where people want to go to escape, right? I mean, they want to get out in the environment and escape, you know, day to day, the the rat race of life, so to speak. And they need that uh, outlet and they need to go to, you know, the, the state parks and the nature conservancy uh, trails out in the forest and things like that. They need to, they need a place, you know, they can go and get on the water and, you know, relax. I mean, that's the, and, and there's, there's business to be had there and thrive. And, you know, when you think about also, you talked about some of these uh, businesses that can thrive, uh, in, you know, economically, but also provide that environmental benefit. You mentioned solar, mm-hmm. but I want to talk more about renewable energy in general, because that's such a, it covers a lot of different types of energy sources that I think Indiana could, you know, do better in. And, mm-hmm. and I think, you know, some of the areas I think they could really do better in is, is the solar realm. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, there's several forms. we got solar, we got wind, we got, you know, renewable natural gas. You know, you've got energy from, uh, you know, energy efficiencies from potential uh, impacts from all the sectors uh, that, you know, the, the, what, what is the HEC doing to help support Hoosiers transition to a clean energy you know, grid or, 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 you know, clean energy, you know, sources, because I'm struggling as a homeowner mm-hmm. to try to even get solar mm-hmm. at a reasonable cost when I know it's the, the cheapest and I know I can, you know, deploy it and it's, you know, it's there, it's, it's available and, and, um, but it's not feasible. 
Yeah, well, we, we definitely need to adopt better public policy in our state so that rooftop solar becomes a more attractive proposition to you and, and many other Hoosiers. Uh, you know, when I think about the array of renewables technologies out there, the thing, the, the technology that I am personally most enthusiastic about, and I think that it, it's something that reverberates across our organization, is rooftop solar. Yeah. And the reason is because we've got a ton of empty roof space in Indiana. And, you know, nothing better speaks to that when we're driving by a Walmart or a Sam's Club or a Costco or a big warehouse. All big box stores. I mean, all, all those ones up I-65 from downtown and up through Lebanon. I mean, there's so many big box stores. They don't have any solar on those things, I don't think. I mean, exactly. I'd be surprised if they do. Exactly. And and that's that's who we dream of going solar because what it turns out is that the National Renewable Energy Lab, one of our great uh, energy uh, research bodies in America, has concluded that we could get, Sean, as much as 40% of America's electricity from rooftop solar. Oh, and I just know. just imagine, you know, how much land we're saving. Jesse, we I, I, I've been saying this for on the show now for a while. I mean, it needs to be so easy. I go down to Home Depot. I can size up my roof and may take the measurements. I can do it myself and yeah. you can just plug it into the basement or in your electric utility box and it's a plug and play system. And all of a sudden you're on the grid. And if you're producing more energy than you're consuming, it's going back into the, into the, uh, the grid lines. The problem that I think utilities have hmm. is they're not prepared to really become a storage uh, you know, system, because right now they're a transmission system. Mm -hmm. And I think that seems to be one of these, these issues. And I could be wrong, but I think if more people start adding renewables onto the grid, right, mm -hmm. they don't have enough storage to, to, cons you know, to store all the excess that they possibly might generate, or they're going to really try to figure out, well, how do we really throttle back our generation to, you know, balance this out? I mean, I don't think they're ready to go through that exercise yet. I could be wrong, but it seems like that's a big issue in, in a getting some of these utilities to buy off on this approach. You know, what do you, what's your take on that? Well, I think, I think two things come to mind. One is utilities are beginning to figure out that the paradigm is shifting. I mean, 9,000 megawatts of coal have shut down uh, over the last decade and a half. That means that's over half the fleet. So there's this, this acknowledgement on the part of the utilities that they have to have a new vision Source. for generation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, and some of them have gone the route of natural gas, but now there's a recognition that natural gas has that you know, price instability. And of course, there's controversy about it being a high carbon fuel, obviously not nearly as high carbon as coal, but still a high carbon fuel. And so that's leading to this great interest in utility scale renewables notably solar vis-a-vis -vis wind, because there's more uh, likelihood of permitting um, kind of being smoother on the solar side than there is on the wind side. But then the question becomes, as you rightly said, Sean, that how do we pull it off uh, when solar and wind are intermittent resources? And that's where storage comes in. So right. you do have some utilities that are literally committing themselves over the next decade to making very significant investments in utility scale storage. Um, and that will certainly help to accommodate the reality that we're going to become this decentralized grid, whether utilities like it or not, because rooftop solar has gone down by 65% in just about 10 years. And uh, storage is gonna follow that way of having a precipitate drop over the next 10 years, as more and more players get involved in this industry. So I think, and then, of course, you've got electric vehicles and the fact that. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's all going to have a, a big bang on this whole equation, too. And I mean, I would love to get, you know, uh, a utility executive to come onto the show and let's talk mm -hmm. about, you know, rooftop solar consuming these renewables. You know, what's it going to take for these utilities to, you know, what are they doing to, to plan for this? I mean, because to me, we're not going to see massive change we won't see the the cost of solar go down. I mean, like, okay, let's, let's put it in context here. You know, you go to the, you know, big box store, you want to get a nice widescreen TV. Just think what the big widescreens cost, you know, 
just five, six years ago. They were, you know, three, four grand to get you a really nice TV. Now you can buy a 70 inch widescreen, flat screen TV for like 500 bucks. I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see that kind of absolutely yeah. mind blowing change that we've seen with flat screen TVs um, with respect to solar. And I think your dream of of Home Depot selling you know off the shelf solar kits is going to become a reality. I think it needs just- to. I mean, that oh. is. I mean, that's where that's when the environmental transformation in our society is going to take place because it'd be like it's a no brainer. Why wouldn't somebody go spend you know two grand? to go buy enough solar panels on your, your, to put up on your house. You could do it yourself. You know, now you got to take a mortgage out. I mean, they, they want to charge you, you know, $40,000 or $50,000 to come put a brand new solar system in your house. And you're like, okay, let's put this on your mortgage for 30 years or 25 years. I'm like, yeah. and I don't even know if I'm going to be in my house that long. Right. right, right. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. And I, I wouldn't say, uh, at least in my understanding, uh, Sean, I wouldn't, I would put the figure probably more at around 20,000, but that's still a sizable amount of money. And I think that one thing I want to make sure your uh, listeners are aware of is that the federal tax credit is going to wind down. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's stable in 2022. It's going to go down in 2023. It's going to go further down in 2024, barring any federal changes. So people really should go consider going solar now because the federal tax is in credit is probably the best it's ever going to be. And then likewise, unless, unless Biden does something, yeah, I mean, you know, he's got yeah. the green deal, you know, strategies. I mean, who knows? They may, you know, do they something could. right there. They could, they, right? They could. That, that's, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. And the, the other yeah. consideration is at the state level, which is that net metering, uh, which is this notion that uh, when you're selling uh, electricity back to the grid or you're putting electricity back to the grid, you get credited for uh, that electricity on yep. your bill at a retail level. And that policy is going to be eliminated completely by the middle of 2022, barring any legislative action in 2022. And therefore that's another impetus for people to consider going solar now. And the beauty is if you're one of those first movers who who, who go solar now, you have this kind of influence effect on your community, on your neighborhood, on your subdivision right. um, to, to then say, hey, well, maybe we should consider that for our church or for our you know, small business and so forth. So there's, it, it does make sense for say large, um, businesses or, or communities. Uh, for instance, you know, we had, um, um, you know, some, some representatives, some PSG energy on a while back mm-hmm. and, and, and their, their focus is, you know, doing commercial solar for like public schools and, and, you know, public buildings and places like that, because, they're going to be there a long time and it makes sense. It's easy to, to do the ROI mm-hmm. on it and go, Oh, let's do it. And that's great. I mean, I think, um, that's, that's a good, a good, you know, way to do it, but man, residential, we got to come up with a better way soon. Cause, and this, this tax incentive is great, but I mean, it, you know, two years to before it runs out, I just still not affordable. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I feel very confident. Uh, I feel very confident, Sean, that th- this sector is going to, undergo the kind of transformation that we've seen again with flat screen TVs. Yeah, let's hope so. I'm very confident. Let's, about that. let's hope so. Well, let's, let's get into, you know, how concerned is HEC about climate change, you know, and, and, and the state's, you know, national rankings as having one of the highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Talk about that. I mean, this seems to be extremely important and, and it's a kind of a alarming number. Yeah, absolutely. And we're in the top 10 in total carbon emissions uh, in the country. And we're also in the top 10 on a per capita basis. So absolutely. One of the reasons why I moved to Indiana to to try to deal with this issue of the carbon footprint of the state. You know, I think we're seeing a lot of progress in the power sector. As I mentioned, more than half the coal plants uh, have been closed over the last decade and a half. And I think the transportation sector is going to undergo a significant change as you know, these, all these major auto manufacturers get big into EVs. So that's yeah, going to be coming. EVs are coming. That's going to transfer, uh, transform the transportation sector. I greatly worry about the industrial sector. You know, there is some level of kind of voluntary energy efficiency measures that the industry is taking. You, you see some big giant plants use something called CHP combined heat and power. 
but the industry isn't decarbonizing at the pace as power and eventually transportation. So that's where I worry because no state in America is more dependent on industry than Indiana, the highest percentage of gross state product in America. Yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't heard, you know, people like U.S. Steel come out and say we're going to go zero net carbon by 2050 yet. I've heard, you know, the big oil, oil and gas energy companies come out and say it, which is very impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I haven't heard some of those utilities come out and say the same thing yet. I think they're still, you know, trying to figure out you know, what they do, what they should do. And I think eventually they're going to be influenced by, you know, the, uh, the financial uh, markets and, and, and people with their pocketbooks. I mean, I think that's going to be, they're, they're going to have to really move quick to catch up with all these other people are say, making these, these bold uh, predictions or, or claims that they're going to be zero net carbon by 2050 and, you know, half that reduction by 2035. Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, in the absence of carbon pricing, which of course we'd really support, greatly support, we think it's a very rational uh, economic policy. Uh, you know, again, provided that there are nice cushions for industries in transition and for the low income Americans. But uh, in the absence of carbon pricing, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, you've got to have shareholders advocating for uh, change and meaningful climate policies on the part of these industries. You've got to have the people um, that are upstream in the process, the buyers of the steel, the buyers of iron, the buyers of fertilizer, uh, exerting pressure. Uh, on the downstream companies to say, look, you've got to decarbonize. I think that will be the the way of transformation. I mean, you've seen that with Walmart having enormous influence in oh, yeah. of, you know, its suppliers and, and saying, look, you've got to ad- adopt more aggressive sustainability goals. And- well, I mean, that is, that's, that's, you know, ESG and sustainability reporting, um, you know, investors are going to be looking at that. I mean, it is going to be one of those required, it's one of those required SEC filing do- documents now that's part of the, you know, the, what's the climate risk that these companies have. So that's a big, that's a big new uh, requirement for a lot of companies that they're going to have to, you know, produce real numbers, real data that says this is what they're doing. <laughs> you can't be greenwashing this stuff much longer because we're, we're going to find out what you're really reporting on. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. But, um, well, you know, you get you talk a little bit about open spaces and, um, you know, what are some of the best opportunities that we had to preserve forest lands and woodlands in Indiana right now? Because I, I know that seems to be near and dear to HEC's heart. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, it's been part of our DNA really since the beginning when we were founded in 1983. And, you know, one of the big initiatives that we we worked on um, back in the 80s was to prevent a very aggressive logging plan to the Hoosier National Forest, which is this incredible um, Midwestern uh, forest uh, area in our state uh, covering multiple counties. And unfortunately, uh, they're seeing a little bit of a redux, which is that there are two uh, big blocks of the Hoosier National Forest that are uh, being proposed for very aggressive logging and burning. And uh, we're pushing back along with other uh, forest-minded allies. And, uh, you know, I think perhaps an even bigger uh, threat to forests, or maybe a parallel threat to forests, I should say, rather than a bigger threat, is the fact that we are uh, proposing another uh, there, Indiana is proposing another highway for Southwest Indiana called the Mid-States Corridor Project, uh, which would um, uh, possibly destroy um, parts of the Hoosier National Forest footprint in the sense that it wouldn't necessarily go through the HNF, but it would go through an area of land that could eventually become a part of the Hoosier National Forest. It could also uh, destroy uh, woodlands and forest land along the East Fork of the White River uh, in Martin County. And so uh, we, that's a project we are opposed to. And and we're wanting to say, look, let's simply upgrade the existing roads we have, make them safer. Uh, and um, not only are we improving the safety of our existing roads, but we're preventing the damage of one of the most amazing assets in our state, uh, something that I think makes Southwest Indiana very, very special in the entire state. Sure. And I would say, you know, one other dimension of, of open space protection, in addition to sort of preventing ill-founded projects from moving forward uh, is also to simply make sure that there's enough money that we're investing in 
uh, preventing the destruction of endangered woodlands and wetlands across the state. You know, we've got land trusts in Indiana, and we have this uh, phenomenon across America and other parts of the world where you've got land trusts, privately owned land trusts that are steadily buying land, but it's not enough. And you need state government to also step in. And so we've been pushing for more investment on the part of the state government, in what's called the Benjamin Harrison Conservation Trust, uh, so that they have the money to assist the private land uh, trusts to save more and more open space in our Indiana. I mean, we only get a, well, only five or six percent of our uh, total area in Indiana is protected, permanently protected open space. In in Wisconsin, it's eighteen percent. In Michigan, it's twenty eight percent. So mm. a long way to go to safeguard our uh, precious natural resources in Indiana. Sure, sure. Well, I mean. Well, I mean, we've touched on some wetlands and why that matters and some of the strategies. I mean, what are you guys doing to, uh, you know, work with lawmakers to, you know, make that a, a, you know, a more protected resource? Yeah, well, we we um, suffered a setback in the state <clears throat> in the 2021 session where um, lawmakers in the original bill that was filed in the 2021 session wanted to wipe away all state protections for wetlands. And so mm. part of wetlands in Indiana are protected by the feds, part of it by the state. It would have eliminated all protections for the state. <clears throat> Thankfully, that bill got slightly better in that um, a, a category of wetlands that were under threat were protected. But then the other two categories of wetlands were damaged through this public policy. In fact, protections were completely eliminated for what are called class one wetlands because of this bill, SB 389. Now, there is a wetlands task force that has been initiated in the General Assembly. It was the, it's a creature of that same terrible bill. Um, and we hope that the wetlands task force will carefully study our wetlands in our state and make a convincing case to lawmakers that we need to in some ways, reverse what we did in the passage of 389 and protect more wetlands. Because mm. at the end of the day, as you know so well, Sean, being in the having been in the area of water policy for a long time, you know, wetlands are incredible sponges. They can yeah. absorb you know, one million. They're filters. They're the fil they're natural filters of uh, our public waters. Exactly. They're phenomenal filters. They're phenomenal storage areas, and especially since Indiana is predicted to have more frequent and more intense flooding over time. The case for more wetlands makes even greater sense since we're going yeah. to absorb those flood waters. And of course, they are uh, the habitat for a large That's percent right. of birds. Yeah, they, they provide that needed habitat for, you know, birds and waterfowl and, and other, you know, invertebrates and, you know, other mammals in, in Indiana for sure. So, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, some of that wetland, uh, legislation could be, you know, turned back into more protective. Let's, let's see what you guys can do to help, you know, get some more uh, support from the legislature and, and build some bridges with some of these new uh, lawmakers to help, you know, make that uh, happen. But uh, and I guess, I guess a big question is, you know, what's it like being a watchdog for the citizens of Indiana? I mean, it feels great. I'll tell you that's, that's one of the things that people cheer us, you know, I, as we talked about earlier, you know, one of the things that I have wanted to do leading this organization for, for now almost 14 years is to emphasize that the policies that we're advocating for are good for the environment and the economy. And I think that does represent, resonate with conservatives. But I'll tell you that if you talk to the average rank and file member of Hoosier Environmental Council, whatever their politics, the thing that probably most excites them is the fact that we are a watchdog that we, we will hold government accountable and possibly through legal action. And we will hold pol polluters possible, possibly through legal action. Well, that's good. I mean, that's, that's, that's great to know. I mean, you've got that uh, backing um, and uh, I'm sure you've got, you know, your legal team there. Do you guys have your own in-house legal team? Is that, uh, is that accurate? Uh, we've got one uh, amazing uh, full-time attorney, uh, Kim Ferraro, who is the one who led our victory uh, against the Army Corps of Engineers a few weeks ago. Oh, and we have had, thank you, and we have had um, other in-house attorneys before, and uh, we are expected to have another one join our team in 2023. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, so what you mentioned earlier, you've got 17,000 followers on social media. What, what's the role and how do you using your social media to, you know, 
bring awareness to the masses? I think it's 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 it, when it, when we began this arena, I think it was phenomenally successful in that uh, we'd put up a post and organically it would be read by a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand people. It's become harder over time because everyone is now doing that, and <laughs> the algorithms that Facebook and other social media platforms have adopted have led to less exposure um, for any given uh, post organic. Marginalizing your message a bit. You know, it, it seems to be uh, not that we're saying that there's a conspiracy here, but I think that they're upping the ante for what I feel the same way, Jesse. I send out posts. I get nothing, no likes, hardly anything on the, on my social media feeds. It drives me crazy. Um, and I'm like, is anybody listening? I don't understand this. I mean, this is no. important information. We got to get this stuff out there. I agree. Get more followers. You. Subscribe Amen. to this stuff. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. I um yeah, we do. And and I think that requires us to be more creative. And sure. one of the ways we've done that is, um, you know, we've used a really cool tool that's called Canva, where you can design professional oh, yeah. graphic design. You, you've seen that. And that's helped. I use it. <laughs> awesome. And then, you know, micro videos, you know, putting up a one minute segment of a cool podcast like Sean Gray's. And we're going to do it. We're going to put one up for us, me and you, Jesse. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So, you know, I think that thing is also going to Kind of create currency too so we've just got to be more creative in how we penetrate penetrate through that's what, right essentially it's noise yeah it's just be i mean you got to be consistent be constant and just keep it going um well you know okay so the big question is you're stepping down hmm. you know kind of a big decision you know yes. you've been at the helm for 14 years yes. you know a lot of people in hec doesn't know anything different than jesse carbonda being the leader what's going to happen with the HEC, and then what's your plan to move forward? Well, it's, it's been an incredible honor to lead the organization for almost 14 years. And I think what gives me great uh, serenity about this decision is, is largely because we have a fantastic staff, highly professional uh, and, um, you know, experts in, in some of the key areas of uh, environmental policy like coal ash and factory farming and wetlands protection and water quality and, and lead uh, prevention, which, which is a topic we only touched upon. The, so I think it's the fact that we have a great staff that we built up over that 14 years, two and a half times the size it was uh, staff-wise than when I became ED. I think that gives me a lot of hope that there will be a lot of continuity. And I think that there's a culture that we've developed over these years of collegiality, of open-mindedness, of bridge building that I hope will, will outlast my, my tenure. And so then the question becomes, what will I do uh, yeah, after making right. this really difficult decision? You know, it's really been the toughest decision that I've ever had to make um, to sort of willingly uh, sort of step down when, when we are, I think, doing great things and are financially sound and so forth. Uh, the reason is because my heart has really been tugged to focus on these big issues of the extinction crisis of facing the planet and the issue of the fact that Indiana's addiction to factory farming is actually a far more prevalent ph phenomenon. You see it happening in South America, in, in, in Mexico, oh, wow. Africa, oh, wow. Asia, and it's a system that is unsustainable on many fronts, health-wise, um, in terms of obviously the cruelty to animals, and of course, the impact that it has on the environment and climate. And so I'd like to be an author uh, that focuses on a very creative approach to trying to engage people in these very complex and, and in some ways discouraging issues since they are ones that can have permanent harm to countless animals across the planet. And uh, yeah, become, uh, become a writer. And That's author. great. Yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, you know, the best of luck for you there. I'm looking forward to some some uh, material that you're going to end up producing here in the, in the near future. Uh, make sure you, you come back on the show. I've interviewed several authors on the show that with uh, some really fantastic books. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can hook you up with a, with a, uh, uh, you know, a publisher if you need one. <laughs> I know one. <laughs> He's a good one. <laughs> awesome. awesome. No, so, love, let me know. This person. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so happy to be on this program and I'm really glad Sean that you do it because I think you're really, spotlighting all these pressing issues and you know there's there's a clock to the environmental problem I and mean, i think that's what has kept people like me motivated to be in it because we know that there is a permanence 
to the damage that can be done in in many cases. And I think sure. you're putting a spotlight on it is is really important. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for the kind words there, Jesse. You know, we're going to keep uh, putting out these uh, shows and, and, you know, shining a light on people are making an impact in, in this environmental industry. And, and hopefully, you know, along the way, environmental transformation has taken place. So Definitely. All right, buddy. Well, thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll be getting this out real soon um, next week. And make sure we hit all social media outlets. So we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you, Sean. Great to be on the program. Thank you.